three. Uh, so uh, nice to be the second one, not the first one. And thanks to John, it's a tough act to follow for me. So this talk is not going to be at all visionary or, or general. It's going to be just about some stuff that we do for fun. It's not even a particularly serious topic of research. One of the reasons I wanted to do this, this particular topic is because, well, I was asked to give a talk, and uh, rather than reuse for the umpteenth time some other talk that I already had, I kind of forced myself to create a set of slides for the talk that I haven't given before. So you are my trial audience for this talk. And as uh, well, we said, this is about the link, the kind of a system that we cooked up for to support private proximity-based uh, social network interaction. And this is joint work with a uh, Ronald Petlich from the uh, University of uh, Sutherland, uh, Darbrücken, and uh, Scott Faber, who is one of my PhD students. So. This uh, is just a snapshot of my current research. It gives you interest in what I actually do. Uh, so the, I have a certain interest in privacy and social networks, not because I love social networks, as has become abundantly clear at the end of the presentation. I do not love social networks. Uh, one of the directions of our work is in uh, stylometric privacy. Here we try to actually undermine privacy and see how little privacy one gets with uh, providing content for social networks. And this is useful for identifying duplicate uh, accounts across and within social networks. Basically what we are able to show is that people who provide content, whether they do it for, for Facebook, uh, Twitter, or TripAdvisor, or Yelp, these networks that we don't think necessarily as social networks, but survive on user-provided content, that writing is like your fingerprint. And so when you write something, you leave a substantial personal fingerprint behind. And we can, with sufficient amount of writing, we can actually link accounts and incarnations of the same human being across and within social networks. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is sort of more cryptographically supported uh, privacy in social networks. Uh, I also have a lot of interest in uh, genomic privacy, and here we look at uh, personal genomics. So the vision of the future, or rather near future, uh, is that uh, everybody will be able to get their genome sequenced, and you know, provided how self-involved and introspective we all are, it will be like the ultimate navel gazing for everybody. We'll be, you know, studying ourselves, uh, you know, from life to death, and. Uh, taking apart our genome and, you know, uh, foreseeing diseases and all kinds of other things, it will be fun. It will certainly burn lots and lots of science. But in the process, we will also run a lot of privacy risks. And um, well, me and my group, we look at various ways of protecting privacy in this future world where personal genomics becomes reality. Well, a completely different end of the spectrum, I also work on security and embedded devices. And here we look into well, what is today unfortunately called IoT, kind of a, a CPS, pick your favorite uh, buzzword, you know, but really what I'm looking at is low-end embedded devices and trying to uh, devise techniques for uh, detecting presence of unwanted software, and in other words, malware, um, and potentially disinfect devices of such malware. Well, uh, Back to privacy, we also had some work on private database query where we look at uh, searchable encryption techniques and various other uh, cryptographic tools that help support uh, outsourced encrypted database queries in such a way that neither the querier nor the database owner learn about each other's data beyond that what is allowed. Uh, again, uh, something completely different is usable security has been a long interest of mine and here my, one of my hosts, Ashokan, and I share quite a long-term interest in this area. Um, basically, the, the idea behind this is that, well, it's easy to sit in a ivory tower or in the dark office and, you know, devise techniques and uh, publish papers even at really good venues that do all kinds of security and privacy. but. Ultimately, if your security and privacy 
touches the user and the user isn't capable, the average user isn't capable of using them, well, they're nothing but useless. And then uh, as a hobby, I kind of gotten into biometrics as of recent. Um, that's always a fascinating field, full of surprises. And last but not least, um, I work out, well, part of my group works on security and privacy, uh, certain future internet architecture, uh, in particular, name data networking and uh, context centric networking. So I will not be talking about any of that. If you want more information, go to that website where some reasonably outdated stuff can be found. Um, and this is a privacy preserving outline. <laughs> So nobody can accuse me that I don't leak a lot of information ahead of time. So uh, let's take a look at today's uh, social networks. You know, we all know them. Some of us love them. Some of us not so much. Uh, Facebook simply comes up to the top of the list. If you're Chinese or Chinese speaking, then probably Renren is what comes to the tip of your tongue when you think about a sense. If you're a teenager or, uh, you know, Tumblr may be more appealing or uh, if you're a Russian speaker, maybe uh, VK, right? And then they, if you uh, think of yourself as, well, professional, right? If you know what CV stands for, then maybe you have an account on LinkedIn. Just uh, for the pur purpose of full disclosure, I have no accounts in any of them except for LinkedIn and I didn't join it voluntarily, but I am a member. Um, well, yeah, enough said. What it is, it's a global heaven for voyeurs and exhibitionists. And even if you are not a born voyeur and exhibitionist, you will become one. It will suck you in. And I know you know I'm right. And even if, you, if it's not true about you, you know people who are voyeurs and exhibitionists. Who will spend hours and hours trawling the OSNs for information about themselves and their friends and their belief to be friends. And it's really great for people who are actually socially awkward, right? Because it allows them to sort of pursue social, sort of pseudo-social uh, life in an antisocial way, alone with their computer. Um, well, like it or not, it, you know, it is a fact that the, the online social networks percolated into many spheres of life, not just the website that provides that entertainment, right? So. A lot of them provide uh, messaging capability, right? Uh, OSNs are often used as platforms for single sign-on, right? So you can, if you have a Facebook account, you can access many services, right? Uh, it's, it, it becomes moderately useful and in some ways even in this, almost indispensable. And it's impossible to deny that OSNs have reached uh, this enormous popularity worldwide. There's probably no country, maybe with the exception of North Korea, that, that hasn't had this uh, epidemic of online social networks reaching it. Right? And, but the, the one observation I make, and you may, may or may not agree with me, is that sort of fundamentally the, the OSNs, like Facebook, have reached the limits of their penetration in society. Right? So the, the older generation of OSN users are probably sort of grandmas and grandpas who sort of creak around, creak along, you know, when their younger members of their family show them how to use it. And then there are these power users, right, the people in their 20s, right, who, who started probably as teenagers and have, they are the old timers of the social network. And then there's the new generation. The new generation doesn't really want to join Facebook, but they join another hipper, slicker, sexier. Right, uh, social network, whatever that is, Ask a Fam, Instagram, you name it. But what's next, right? What's 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 going to happen next? What is the next step for the OSM penetration? Right, and that I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't think any of you do. But just my two cents is that one possibility we're going to see, and we're already seeing accounts, social network accounts for pets. I've already witnessed uh, a lizard having a Facebook account. <laughs> a hamster with a Facebook account. And inanimate object, you know, like a door. 
Why not? Right? Why not a piece of furniture? Why should only human beings have social network account? Doors have personalities, right? They creep, they open, they're, 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 some are old, some are new, some are metal, some are wood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They can have relationships with humans who open them, right? Why not? Right, we can all, we can all just, we can dream, right? Uh, and we can have this, of course, behind each door, there should be a human, right? So there'll be this ventriloquistic operation of, of uh, social network accounts, right? Obviously, the lizard is, well, lizards don't have a lot of energy, right? So I'm not going to type a lot, but, you know, maybe it will, or a dog uh, might not do beyond, anything beyond bark, but then you could uh, probably provide some input into the you know, account. So that's one way. Um, you know. But I seriously, right? Seriously. I think what's needed is offline or sense support. And I'll I'll get into why I think that's that's needed and why I think it's a good thing. Uh, privacy, of course, this talk is about privacy, but privacy is not the only reason why uh, offline or sense support is a good thing. And the other thing is this. Now, I'm not gonna talk about this beyond this slide, but I do think there's a big market out there. OSN for the dead. And I don't mean those who die while OSN using. I'm not talking about, you know, some unfortunate soul who croaked, you know, and his Facebook account is like festering there. No, I mean, there's actually some social, uh, sort of informatics type researchers who look into that, what happens to dead people's accounts. Right? But I'm talking about OSN for those who are dead, never had accounts. You know, a lot of people who are interested in um, ancestry research. So you could uh, imagine uh, those people could create accounts for their long dead ancestors. And since they know or have some idea due to family histories of albums or whatever, who their ancestors knew or where they were from, they could create sort of these backwards going connections between dead people. And so there could be uh, this whole subterranean, right? This whole Never, never worldly OSN for the dead. And it doesn't have to be separate. It could actually connect to the living because some of the dead knew the living. Some of the living knew the dead. So you see, they're sounding a little bit morbid there. Eh? Just a little bit. But that's not what my talk is about. I just thought this is, this is an idea. Anyway, what about privacy? There's lots of righteous, self-righteous noise about privacy. Why privacy is good, why we should all have privacy. Nobody, even the experts, can define succinctly what privacy really means, but we all want it. My question, the reasonableness of expecting privacy from a social network. Right? Tons of papers are written, lots of research. That's the brain cycles. Is it reasonable to expect privacy from a social network? Just the word privacy and the word social in the same sentence are a little bit strange, right? I think of it as, you know, if you choose to go to a nude beach full of people, you can't go there all naked and ask people not to look at you. Right? So expecting privacy from a social network is unreasonable. But maybe you can expect at least some, some kind of a loincloth, right? But before we do that and ask how much privacy is reasonable, maybe we should ask, why don't we have privacy, fundamental? Is it because it's social or is it because it's centralized? And today's social networks are obviously centralized. They are run by, by for-profit, uh, Entities, right? every single behemoth, right, in the social network market is a is a for-profit entity. No matter what politically correct slogans they spout, so they're not interested in privacy, at least beyond making statements. Right? So, one one 
natural way of, of considering privacy or addressing privacy is to say, well, why don't we just distribute something that's centralized? Isn't that the typical computer science approach? Either throw a tree at it or distribute it. So that has been done. Uh, there is a, I don't know if it still runs, but there was a social network called Diaspora that for a while was in the news. A couple of uh, scrappy kids in San Francisco put it together. It fizzled. There was a research project called SafeBook. Also, a pretty solid idea, good system design, good crypto underlying it. Fizzled. Well, we can debate for, for a long time why that happens, but my claim is that there is something wrong with this whole distributed P2P type social network model. It works well for sharing illicit files, funky pictures, movies, but it doesn't work well for just hosting other people's profiles. So maybe I'm wrong, I'm they happen to be wrong, but given today's uh, state of affairs, I think these the distributed social networks are unlikely to succeed on any kind of large scale, maybe on some small scale they could, in a, in a, in a homogeneous setting. By the way, I don't mind questions in the middle, so if uh, you'll keep me awake, and maybe some of you, so feel free. Um, so what is the motivation for offline social network interaction? Well, I can give you some. Right, so you want some functionality in environments where the network isn't there, right? or the network is difficult to access. It could be because you're on Wi-Fi and it's a, a low bandwidth, lossy, crappy, connectivity keeps dropping. Um, it could be that it's expensive. Like you're in a place like on a, on a ferry to God knows where. Right? From Helsinki you can go many places. And they charge you. You're on a cruise ship, or you're on a plane, and the airline is gouging you, you know, for for tens of dollars or euros for you know every gigabyte or megabyte you want to send. Right. So, and then there are still places in the world that are remote enough they do not have internet connectivity. And there are also the environments like underwater, in the air, in the underground. Right, if you go spelunking, maybe you're going to have a hard time uh, finding a base station. And once in a blue moon, there are outages. So online social networks aren't uh, infallible, right? They, they can go down, and they do go down sometimes. And so what do you do then, right? Especially if you're, truly, if you're a true believer and a true addict. How do you, like, survive? If Facebook access is water to you, what do you do when there's no Facebook? And then, last but not least, you just have a personal preference of not to connect to social network. Right? You may want to have some limited functionality, but you don't want to uh, connect to the mothership for various reasons. So let's consider two scenarios. One scenario is Alice and Bob meet in person, right? Physically meet say hello to each other, they talk, as most people well, who are not socially challenged, they ask a few questions back and forth, they discover some common things, right? Like friends, maybe uh, they went to the same school, maybe uh, they are from the same place, maybe they traveled in the same area, maybe they like the same wine, okay? So they discover some common factors and then being good OSM users, they later decide to connect. Great, right? They met in person, and then they connect. This happens to me a lot, unfortunately, more than I'd like to admit. I meet somebody, talk to them, not necessarily discover lots of common factors. Then sometime later, I get the LinkedIn request. Because I go, what do I do? I have to ask me. How do, do I know this person enough to actually click on that link? Yes, or do I say spam, or do I say I do not know this person? Because I actually often usually don't. So 
Anyways, so they could connect, and this is good for the social network, right? Because the social network now benefits from this, right? Because a new connection is established that whose root is offline, right? It get bootstrapped offline and then translated into an online connection, which is great, right? I mean, this is the this is all the, for the benefit of the social network, and of course, where Alice and Bob then. Of course, nothing could happen. They could decide not to connect. In particular, one of them might not be an OSN user, but that's unlikely, so they might decide not to connect. We don't have enough in common. Forget it. The OSN hasn't suffered, right? The OSN hasn't lost anything here. Right? The analogy is that if the tree fell in the forest and OSN wasn't there, who cares, right? It didn't lose it. So OSN learns nothing if Alice and Bob do not proceed. Now in the second scenario, we have OSN user X and OSN user Y, not Alice and Bob, just X and Y. They meet, but not, not in a physical way. They may be near each other, but they don't, they're not aware of each other's physical being, right? They discover some common factors. And then if these common factors are sort of mutually acceptable or sufficient, <coughs> they reveal themselves to each other as Alice and Bob. So now it's no longer X and Y, now it's Alice and Bob. They talk, then they decide to connect later. This is good, right? More people connecting means less strife in the world, right? And it's good for the OSN, good for Alice and Bob, right? And everybody lives happily thereafter. Or nothing happens. They decide not to connect. In which case, who loses? Nobody loses. Alice and Bob hadn't lost anything because, well, they didn't want to connect. They just well, spent some time chatting. The OSN doesn't learn anything in that case and shouldn't learn anything. And that's my assertion. That it shouldn't learn anything because it's none of its business. They talked offline. They didn't connect. Nobody should know about this except them. So the claim is, maybe a little bit ham-fisted claim at this point, is that private offline interaction of the kind you saw in a, in a scenario two is good for both OSN users and the OSN itself. And so if we had a way of supporting this kind of interaction, both users and the provider would benefit. So let's redo the generic scenario. Alice and Bob are near each other, okay? They are unaware of each other's sort of physical presence, but they're near each other. I mean, they, when I say not unaware of physical presence, they don't know what one another looks like or where they're sitting. Somewhere near. So then they discover each other's presence somehow. They discover each other's presence as some OSN users. Now I have an asterisk there. And what it means is not it's just OSN users, but OSN users who chose to take part in such interactions. Right? I want to make sure that not everybody should be forced to take part in such interactions. If they don't choose to be, they don't need to. And then they somehow privately compare features of their profiles. Right? So we have these profiles. That's what all OSN is having in common. There's something in your profile, like your name or your age or your gender. And your friends or connections or pals or whatever they're called in that lingo of the particular OSN. Right? And then there's, there's tons of other stuff like uh, education and whatever you choose to put in. And so they compare their profile features and, they, and if they, and then they somehow determine the number or the magnitude of features in common. So, right? And then based on that, they decide whether to proceed and to reveal each other's identities and talk and maybe, you know, continue socializing, right? It's a social method. Or they could do nothing. They could just drop it. If there's not a sufficient uh, number of common things, yeah, just drop it. Right? And then later, right, later, when they regain connectivity or choose to regain connectivity, then they could connect. And that could happen organically, without any meddling from anyone else. Now, OSN would benefit. 
Now, if we, if we were to believe this fairy tale, right, if you're with me so far, then the question is, who should do this? Who should support this kind of a offline, uh, private interaction? Well, the natural uh, answer is the, the OSN provider itself should support it. Right? I mean, it should be easy for them. They all have apps, right? There's a Facebook app, there's a Twitter app, there's a LinkedIn app, right? And I'm sure there are all the others have um, apps for laptops and, 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 and definitely for mobile phones, right? So you can imagine they just provide this kind of a functionality that kicks in when you're offline. And you could then choose to be on it or not. Um, or maybe not, maybe they'll just force you to take part. But that would be the natural place. But then the OSN itself isn't incentivized, at least naturally so, isn't incentivized to respect or maintain privacy. So then it would surreptitiously could record a lot of information about the interactions that lead to nothing. Right? Interactions that do not yield a connection. And whose business is this? I claim not theirs. They could also snoop on activity offline, meaning location. Right? Where, are you, where are you interacting with people with whom you connect or not connect later? So that incentivizes the second answer, which is to provide a separate service that uh, is latched onto an existing uh, online social network for the purpose of offering this kind of private offline interaction. Now, the other thing we should be cognizant of is that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, but then on the, uh, in an offline setting, you can just be anywhere. You can claim to be whatever, whoever you want and graduate from whatever colleges with whatever degrees and have friends galore. Right? In fact, more socially awkward people tend to have more friends. And the, because the term friend means or connection means less. So you can claim whatever you want. That would be bad. So what we need is some kind of uh, security of that information. So the profile information that is used as input into private interactions offline should be authentic, should have integrity. Right? So this means that the profile information should be at least as believable as it, as it is when you see it online on a social network. So this leads to our more granular design goals for this uh, unlinked system, which is more generally support for offline interaction. That's all well and good. Ideally, we would like to have anonymity with respect to peers. Right? That means that now, if you interact with somebody and later establish a connection, anonymity doesn't mean anything, right? Because obviously, you're willing to disclose your ID or your name or both. But let's consider interactions that do not lead to anything. Right, spurious interactions that do not translate into a mutual uh, revealment of names or subsequent connection on the, on the OSN. So ideally we'd like to have anonymity so that people when they meet and decide not to do anything about that, they don't really know who they met. On the other hand, it could be annoying if we do that because you could be meeting the same person over and over and over and over, discover that you have nothing in common. Right? Maybe it happens to you, you know, when people go to the same kind of parties and they, and they drink enough, right? This happens. You kind of start talking to the same person and you're like, wait a second, I talked to them before. I have nothing in common. Right? So this, this, this is annoying. Right? So whether anonymity is really a good thing here is debatable. But at least we would like to have pseudonymity, right? So you don't, may not know who this is that you decided not to connect to, but if you see them again, you wouldn't waste your time trying to discover common factors because you know you don't have any, not enough. Uh, you'd like to have interaction privacy with respect to OS and provider. That's what I just mentioned earlier, which is if nothing, if, 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 if an interaction does not lead to later OS and connection, then the OS and provider should not learn about it. That's the fundamental privacy feature. And then the OS and connection spillover means that 
in case the two people reveal each other's identities, then there should be a, an easy way, sort of a segue into the OSM connection later if they both, if they both choose to uh, do it. And then the security part is maintaining OSM profile authenticity and owner authentication. So the profiles that are sucked out from the social network and then used for offline as inputs into offline interaction should be authentic. And they should not be something that can be passed around. Okay, so there should be some authenticity of ownership, a proof of ownership. The ideally should be always an independent operation. Now this is nice to have, but uh, difficult to achieve in practice, right? Because some things are fairly generic, right? Like the interaction is basically to fast forward a little bit is a is a cryptographic or a set of cryptographic protocols that compare sets of features like friends and job, you know, employers, or educational institutions, things like that. So at that level it's generic, but the devil is in the details. His OSNs vary quite widely in what kind of information uh, they allow um, to see in their profiles, and include in their profiles. Uh, let's see. So. So actually, that, I skipped this. This is always an agnostic design. The OSN independent operation means that we'd like to operate independently from the OSN. And so we'd like not to, not to ask it for too much. Now, this is impossible to achieve completely because some information has to come from the OSN, in particular the profile. And last but not least, voluntary participation. Users should opt in for this kind of interaction. Not everybody will want to interact uh, offline. So this is on linked, uh, and as the name suggests, it's based on LinkedIn. Now, the, as I said, the design is really uh, rather generic, but the current incarnation is based on LinkedIn. Why? Because, well, partly because I already had, a, it was the only one I had an account on, so the only one I really understood, and uh, it's viewed as a kind of a, I don't know, respectable professional. Although I, I know 13-year-olds who have LinkedIn accounts. So I don't know how respectable and professional it is. Yeah. But it has that kind of an aura. Uh, so we have a, done an Android smartphone platform. Uh, and it has two components, right? So there's an actual app, the Unlinked app, that implements some cryptographic tools, protocols. So these acronyms, they stand for uh, authorized two-way private set intersection, right? And that's a mouthful. And the second one is authorized two-way private set intersection cardinality. And the name should tell you just about everything you need to know. Uh, and uh, yeah, they said they implemented within an Android application framework. And they, uh, the communication between the apps, right, between the Alice and Bob who choose to use this application is done via Bluetooth. Eh, that, uh, that could be done better. Of course, ideally we would have Wi-Fi or some other better means of reliable, physically proximate communication, but Bluetooth is the only thing we got at the moment. And the second component is an online server, which is kind of a, a certification authority, if you will. So what it does is essentially it uh, registers the user. When the user first downloads the app, and to download the app, you kind of have to be online, right? So that's the excuse, right? So when you download the app from what, like the App Store, you have to be online. So at that point, when you initialize the app, it will contact uh, our server, and then it will ask you to log in to LinkedIn. Right? And that's a bird's eye view kind of way. You, get, you log in to LinkedIn, and then it passes a token from LinkedIn, something called an OAuth token, to our server, and then the server obtains an authentic copy of user's profile, not from the user because the user could cheat, but from LinkedIn itself. So that way we know it comes from the horse's mouth. And so the server then signs this profile, signs some elements from this profile, as details are too much at this moment, and then returns it to the user. So this way it kind of acts as a certification authority and registration authority and the interface to the online social network. But it's pretty stateless doesn't actually keep a lot of information. We, in fact, today it does keep track of uh, who is registered, just for accounting purposes. 
But in principle, it doesn't need to give any information about anybody, including users who are using it. It doesn't need to, because it, it isn't necessary in the offline phase, which is the more important phase, clearly, because it's not there. So these are the three, four phases. So right, the first phase is like, you have users who join the online social networks. This happens presumably a long time beforehand. Then in phase B, that's the phase when the user downloads the app, or okay, Alice installs it, and logs into the OSN, contacts our server, provides the authentication token our server, pulls the profile, extracts features, signs and returns to Alice. Now, perhaps a long time later, or whatever time, whatever it happens, uh, in phase C, the third phase, Alice and Bob, or X and Y, as they might be known, uh, partake in this uh, offline interaction. That's where sort of the family jewels are in the offline interaction. And then in part D, they may, or may, they may later connect to each other on a social network. So I guess the UMS doesn't verify the profile, it just signs whatever that's in the profile. It connects via whatever secure channel to LinkedIn, provides the OAuth token, gets the profile, so it comes over a secure pipe, but doesn't do any further verification. So I can uh, put something on my profile, get the certificate, remove it from my profile? No. Remember, look at the interaction five and four. The profile does not come from the user. No, no, I mean, I can put something on my profile no. on LinkedIn. Ah, yes, that's a, that's a crucial difference. You cannot put it on your profile unilaterally. You have to do it on the social network. Now, if you put me as your connection on LinkedIn, LinkedIn will let you do it unless I agree. You cannot gratuitously insert me, right? This is where we say we lean on the features already provided by the social network. Okay. You cannot friend me or connect to me without me acquiescing. But you don't only look at friends, you also look at other attributes, right? I can say I no, okay. Absolutely. I went to Harvard. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. You can, I don't know what, if anything, they do, right, uh, to verify, um, probably nothing. In that sense, you can choose whatever you want. But the interesting thing is that if you put 15 different educational institutions, LinkedIn will contact you. They will, you know, if, the, if you put Cambridge, at Harvard as your educational institutions, and you meet me, right? You know, and you decide I'm going to. Damn, I, 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 I wish I went to MIT. I, I would have liked to like insert MIT. You can't, right? You can't because to do that you would have to go back online, modify your profile, contact our server to reissue a certificate, come back to me. And see, that's which you could do in a well-connected world, right? If you are in a connected world, you could, right? You could. Certainly. I can do it without sort of uh, social exposure because I can add it, get the certificate removed. Right. You know, social networks, if they don't do this today, certainly should monitor this kind of chicanery, right? Or this kind of silly behavior, right? Whether they do or don't, I don't know. But here's where I, we sweep everything under the rug of the social network. Say, we, we cannot make it more difficult than the social network makes it for you. But the more important thing is connections. Right? So most social networks say, I know, will not allow you to unilaterally insert a friend or a connection without that person's uh, agreement. Okay? So, when do I need to finish? Um, Sooner the better. Everybody wants lunch. Whatever I told people, I agree a lot. Excellent. Oh, you have time. So. Yeah, so. I already mentioned most of this, so we have this independence from the OSN. Uh, in principle, uh, only the profiles themselves are, are OSN specific. The nice thing about this uh, OAuth framework, if you know how it works, it, it's like a single sign-on, right? So it, uh, it's pretty portable across uh, social networks. And uh, most reputable OSNs, and successful ones are, tend to be somewhat reputable, provide an API, right? That, that Twitter provides an API, Facebook, <coughs> et cetera. Yeah, you can pull stuff off if you have the right knowledge, right? So we also have 
implementation that's relatively independent of the communication medium. Uh, in fact, there should be a, by now a working prototype with Wi-Fi. But it's still creepy because Wi-Fi on Android, Wi-Fi direct on Android is not the great. But we require a, a broadcast channel. So in case you're wondering whether our approach will work with infrared, no. Right? Partly because you, know, you have to know who you're pointing at. So then you're aware. So it's, again, offline proximity based. We do not utilize infrastructure. And this is one of the distinguishing features with respect to the work that uh, Ashokan and uh, some of his colleagues have done on something very similar. So I don't have, unfortunately, related work slide. I should. Uh, and this is for version two of this talk, whenever I give it. I'll add a related work slide, but there is there has been some related work, and one of that is comes from uh, here from Alto in collaboration with uh, yeah. yes with York and uh, and uh, with the UCL right. So there, and there, it also aims to support private uh, uh, offline OSN interactions, but with some different uh, goals and different features. Right. So we we really came to this problem from crypto. From the, from the protocols, we, we had these, you know, uh, exotic little tools based on something called oblivious pseudo-random functions uh, that were pretty nifty for all kinds of other applications that we decided that they would actually serve this scenario well. Um, and uh, basically the tools are these PSI, this, this uh, private set intersection and private set intersection cardinality protocols uh, based on something called the Diffie-Hellman OPRF. Uh, but in fact, the way our design works, you can plug in any other private set intersection protocols, including the ones that based on garbled circuits or homomorphic encryption. Right. The difficult part is, and, and this is where we had to make a little crypto step in our work, is we needed to take protocols that were fundamentally sort of one way, because most of these primitives compute a one way set intersection. It means Alice learns the intersection of common factors with Bob, but Bob learns nothing. So we need to take that and turn it to a two-way version, which is actually not as simple as it sounds. And nothing in cryptography is as simple as it sounds. Um, and we needed to introduce the authorized inputs, which is actually not that difficult, but that's sort of a reasonable detail there. But the two-way part is not, is, not, is not easy because it requires composition. So these are the properties of the of the underlying protocol. So of course, protocols have to be correct, as we all know. It doesn't have to be cryptographic protocol. Any protocol is just correctness as we all want, meaning that if two parties enter their inputs, the protocol will correctly compute the intersection and not a square root of pi. Um, there should be privacy with respect to peer input, which means the protocol should compute an intersection, but parties should not learn anything beyond that. Right? So that means if Alice has 100 friends, Bob has 200 friends, and they have five friends in common, then the only thing that Alice and Bob learn at the end of the protocol is five friends in common. Now there's a little caveat here. If you're running the cardinality protocol, they will only learn the number five. If you're running the set intersection protocol, they will not, we will learn number five plus who are those five that they have in common. But they will learn absolutely nothing about the rest except the number or the size. I, if you want to obscure the size, this is possible. Ask me offline, it's expensive. It's possible. Right? So that's period of privacy. Pseudonymity means Alice and Bob do not learn who each other is. Authenticity means that the profile that's themselves must be authentic, certified by our server. Right? So no forgery, no insertion. And this actually has some unpleasant consequences for uh, flexibility of the protocol. If I remember, I'll mention it again later. Input binding means that these authorizations, though, these authorized uh, sets of friends, connections, education, etc., should not be transferable. And then there should be output integrity, meaning that the output must be correct even if the, if, even if the protocol participants misbehave. Now, this is hard property to achieve because it requires us well, resistance against what we call malicious, fully malicious adversary. And the last requirement is early termination resistance. This is related to kind of fairness. So if you run a protocol that where two parties are supposed to 
uh, symmetrically compute the same thing, right? You'd like to ideally have the property that if the protocol aborts, whether accidentally or maliciously, that the two parties learn approximately about the same amount of information. You don't want one to be sort of very much advantaged over the other. So since uh, time is running and lunch is coming, uh, I will not be subjecting you to gruesome details of this protocol. But if you like crypto, uh, yeah, corner me at lunch. I will promise you will not lose your appetite. Uh, so this is the part B in the operation, right? This is the protocol that happens between our server, the unlinked server, and the user. And basically, it's just a certification of the user's profile, right? But it's not that the actual profile from LinkedIn is sucked out and signed, no. That would be useless, in fact, for privacy. There is, you cannot exchange that information. What we do is instead we take these items, right, the connections from LinkedIn, we blind them, right? So that's what the server does. It blinds them and signs the blinded versions, right? So they become these vectors of blinded items. And this is the actual offline protocol. And it's funny because it's called offline protocol, but it actually it, any, like any protocol, it happens online, but it happens offline in terms of OSN, right? So this is between user A and user B, right? And this is basically a four message protocol. And a standard set intersection, one way set intersection protocol is two rounds, okay? And this is two instances of one way set intersection composed. Now this is for simplicity shown as four messages. In fact, it's three because there's some interplay between them and some, some uh, pipeline that can be done. Won't bore you with that. So what is an authorized two-way private set intersection protocol? Basically, it's a mirrored two-way protocol that privately computes a set intersection. Okay? Each party starts the protocol on its own private input that has been previously authorized by our server, meaning signed. So the first thing that each party does when it receives the first message from the other party is it verifies the signature by our server. So the app knows our server's public key. Uh, the security of this particular protocol you saw is in what's called honest but curious model. If you're not a security person, it doesn't mean anything to you. It might actually be funny or redundant, honest but curious. It is a model where the adversaries, and who is the adversaries here? The adversaries is, well, these parties themselves. Usually we don't think of both being the adversaries because it would be ridiculous, but at least one. Right? So Alice or, or Bob is trying to cheat the other party. So honest but curious means that the, both parties, or even the malicious party essentially, runs the protocol faithfully by the rules. But it's curious, so it tries to kind of misuse the protocol to learn more information, either during or later. Right? So it, just a snoopy kind of a person, right? Who learns, wants to learn a lot more information. This is opposed to what's called malicious model, where the adversary is not bound by any rules and can essentially uh, muck around with its input and mangle protocol messages and not respect the timing and will essentially be a Byzantine kind of adversary. So the protocols I showed you are not secure against this kind of an adversary. But they can be made secure with an addition of something called zero-knowledge proofs, or statistical zero-knowledge proofs. And so what it requires is us to load up the protocols that you saw with some proofs that the party that sends a message, each message, actually provided that message in the correct format. Now, what it really means, if you are a crypto person or a crypto-knowledgeable person, it means that like the party that did the exponentiations and blindings actually knows the exponent that it's used or that the exponent is used is consistently used across different uh, values. Right? And th this is possible with something called Schnorr signatures. Right? It doubles the cost of the protocol. But it is possible. Yeah. And the security, in case you're, again, a crypto geek, OMG here is not, oh my god, although it should be. Right? It's one more gap Diffie-Hellman. Or, oh my god, Diffie-Hellman. Mm -hmm. like that. Now, we don't care about external adversaries because external adversaries are trivially uh, addressed by just establishing secure channels, doing a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, using 
uh, some 80211 blah 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 method. Yeah. Uh, so if each party has user authorized, authorized uh, input, then how to, uh, you, you said you can, your protocol, your PSI protocol can be replaced by other, like Garbo Secure, that method. Yeah. How to replace that if you use Garbo Secure, then there are thousand gates and get, get. You would have to sign whatever the circuit. Yes, but the circuit can only use flags. Then the server has to sign a lot. That's right. So basically, I said I didn't say it could be done efficiently. We can do ours efficiently. If you're using circuits, you would have to sign a circuit for every run of the protocol. Yeah, yeah. Might get expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this one is just the one that computes the cardinality. Now, the reason I'm talking about the, I, I presented both is because. That has to do with policy. You see, users can express a rich set of policies. Ideally, we would like to support them. So one user might say, you know, I, I would like to connect offline or talk offline with anybody with whom I have at least five connections. Right? That's a, that kind of policy says that the user is really interested in finding the cardinality of said intersection. Right? So if I'm, if I'm overseas and I'm in some foreign country, far away from home, you know, if I've, Find somebody nearby with whom I have five connections on LinkedIn. That's kind of interesting, unusual, right? I might talk to them. Uh, whereas I'm at home, I might not care, right? Because I, on, on campus, at the university, I probably run into people like that all the time. Now, I may have a more stringent policy that says, well, you know what? I'll talk to anybody who knows Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Eve. Then I explicitly specify who should be in common, right? Between me and that other person in order for, for us to talk. That incentivizes a set intersection protocol because then I need to learn who exactly is in common among our set. Anyway, policy, well, I better hurry up, but policy is a, is a hairy issue. And one of the more interesting, or, well, interesting, one of the more maddening part of this work is trying to get to support all kinds of reasonable policies. Of course, the definition of reasonable varies quite a bit. So in the very first uh, instantiation of our, of, our, of our app, of our system, we basically chose to support only three policies. But um, I'll just short circuit the slide. And, right? So we, we only support three. And they're basically open, which is essentially no privacy. Just talk to anybody who is uh, it's like a default, right? a very promiscuous mode. You can use our app. But the only, the only thing you get from our app is authenticity. Right? So you actually are able to. Uh, interact offline with anybody. And, uh, to be, somebody who is doing this is probably the person who has a public LinkedIn profile. Right? And some people have public LinkedIn profiles. They expose things like their connection. And, uh, so this would be for those types of people. Uh, low uh, is, you know, we, we just pick the sort of common policy after having interviewed a few, a few LinkedIn users that at least one friend in common and one employer or educational institution. Or at least three friends in common. Right? So any one of those conditions is satisfied, then we connect. And then the medium uh, level privacy is that we have the three connections in common, at least one employer or, or educational institution other than the current one, and then five connections or institution in common. So this is slightly, the bar is slightly high raised. Now, you might think this is a kind of arbitrary, but the, based on our sort of uh, surveys, they kind of suffice. We don't have a high privacy, because we, we don't know yet what that ought to be. And so it's fairly arbitrary, just to make it, because one of the problems with supporting policy, as, as researchers, we like, we'd like to be as flexible as possible, right? To support all kinds of policy. But then weird things pop up. Like if one party says, I want to have, I want to talk to anybody with whom I have th these specific people in common, and the other party says, but no, I want to have, I, I'll talk to anybody who, with whom I have at least 10 connections in common, how do you, how do you put them together? And, and so it's quite possible that users will have incompatible policies. So we wouldn't even know what protocol to run. Do we run a cardinality of set intersection protocol or a set intersection protocol? We cannot do both, right? Because doing both might violate the privacy of one of them. So given how much an average person understands about privacy, we may want to keep it simple and stupid. And so that's this. That's our performance. Mind you, we're doing public key cryptographic operations. These are not signatures. These are exponentiations, because most of the cryptographic uh, heavy machinery is exponentiations in, in, uh, uh, in finite fields. So 
Um, and uh, with fairly small 160 with 320 bit exponents, the input size here refers to number of items in the set. Right? So if you look at something like 10, which is uncharacteristically small, you get almost negligible overhead. Now what setup time means, that's the time to interact with the unlinked server when you're online. The signature size really, that's a better term, it really means the vector that of that blinded vector that becomes input in the protocol that's returned by this. Well, the offline time is the time, start to end time to run the protocol between the two Android devices via Bluetooth. Okay, so if you look at people who would have 10,000 friends, don't know anybody like that, right? But let's imagine somebody who does. Well, then the setup time becomes a pretty hefty 86 seconds, right? But if you have a lot of friends, you know, that's a heavy burden to carry, just having so many friends. So you got to wait like a minute and a half. But that's, that's when you're online. Now the offline time is, well, you're sitting on a plane, you know, it's going to take you 15 seconds to run this protocol with another person if you have 10,000 friends. It's going to kind of a heavyweight uh, protocol, what can I tell you? But if you're stuck on a plane or underground and you have nowhere to go, 15 seconds is all right. And the bandwidth is actually not very interesting because it's on the order of low, now, low, low megabits, right? Seven megabits in the worst case. All right, moving right along. Okay, these are obligatory screenshots. All right, so this is the, the first one is when you install our app, right? It, it tells you to log into LinkedIn. It, allows, it asks you also to uh, provide, um, allow access to your, uh, for us to access your LinkedIn data. And then once you log in, sort of th this is your connections. This screen here just shows you that you have no active interactions, that your phone is not currently, or our app is not currently talking to anybody. But in the past, you interacted with misspelled anonymous. I don't know why, but it is misspelled. So it's always going to be anonymous unless their privacy is low, right? Means that they actually will reveal you their name, but with with any other, it's going to be anonymous. Then this is when you, when the system notifies you that it found two peers. And it will tell you when it, find, when it finds peers, but then it will tell you more like, OK, well, there's one anonymous with whom you have so many connections, and you have another anonymous with whom you have so many connections. And then you can click, and, and there's a chat application that I'm not showing you that once you both decide to reveal each other's identities, you can do a chat. Just because these two anonymous have both 92 connections, uh, 92 common Could be the same. Could be the same, yeah. So you don't have this anonymity at this stage? Right? No, we do actually. Uh, this is a synthetic example, but we actually do. We do keep a cache okay. um, of uh, prior interactions. And today, we don't have like pure anonymity because we think it's going to be annoying for the user. But if you want to, OK, but we do, we do have one other feature, where if you want to have more privacy, what you could ask our server to sign multiple blinded vectors, oh. right? So that way you could you could ask for many and use them, whatever you know. So use different ones at different times. It would still be corresponding to the same information, right? Right. The number of sort of uh, extensions. One of the usability things is that you, you don't want to be doing this kind of a protocol with somebody who's your friend already. Right, that's kind of silly. So we, we, we are trying to do this shortcut where we first kind of embed ourselves as the friend. As I'm my own, I'm my own best friend, right? And you're your own best friend. So we'll see if we are on each other's list, we don't need to run the entire protocol, right? Because we're already friends. Uh, authenticated channels, we currently don't do them, but it's trivial. Um, uh, okay, and linkability I already mentioned. We do support it actually already. We we don't have is the well-functioning Wi-Fi um, implementation, although by the time I get back tomorrow, there should be one. Um, we, there better be one, or bad things will happen. Um, yeah, we also try to detect, sort of uh, keep a log, so detect misbehavior with gratuitous is in, uh, instantiations of the protocol, because the protocol is not, is not cheap, right? The cryptographic operations uh, burn battery power, right? So, we want to be, we are sort of cognizant of the now service possibilities here, but we haven't addressed them yet. Uh, and uh, we have longer term plans to look into Facebook. 
um, and, and other social networks, but for now we're still LinkedIn focused. In any case, if, if this kind of offline interaction takes off, it might be worthwhile to look into more privacy, that is, to obscure affiliation, right? So right now, if you observe network traffic, if you snoop on Bluetooth, or if we do Wi-Fi, if you snoop on Wi-Fi, you might detect that there is a this type of a protocol going on between two LinkedIn users. You will not know who they are, but you will know it's a protocol between two LinkedIn users. If there are multiple social networks, it might be worth to obscure affiliation. And then we would need to introduce something like secret handshakes protocols on top to do that. So in summary, what have you heard? Well, hopefully some motivating uh, stuff about uh, online, private, social, OSN interactions. Uh, I believe that reasonably strong privacy is possible in that setting. Again, I'm not for privacy at all on the real social network. When you're online, it's, I think, still think it's unreasonable to expect it. But offline, you should be able to, uh, to get some. Uh, is it desired? We don't know. Uh, interviews, uh, some pilot interviews and some uh, conversations with uh, social network uh, uh, executives, OSN executives show us that they, they are mildly positive about this, but nobody is jumping to incorporate this feature yet. So uh, it remains unclear whether there is a large scale need for this kind of interaction. I mean, it should be, it should, it's not difficult to foresee that there is a bootstrapping problem. Right? That if you try to run this as an OSN service, that if the OSN buys into this idea, which of course, remember, has some privacy issues, but if they were to buy into this idea, they would have an easy time. They would just diffuse it with their uh, next uh, um, app release. But if you're operating as we do, as a separate service, then we have a problem, right? How do you bootstrap that? And so the only relatively bright idea we had or we heard was to try it in the sort of a um, closed setting, like at a conference, right, where you get an app and you kind of hang out, and like at this this type of a venue, maybe a bit bigger, right, where you hang out and look at posters and mill about and eat in, the, in proximity and spend a lot of time in proximity with people you don't necessarily already know, right. So there are lots of things left to do. And uh, speaking of that, lunch, right? Unless there are further questions. I'm sure there's a lot of further questions, so let's see how many we can take. I don't know. I don't know what's for lunch, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yeah, keep it short. So, uh, can you turn back to page 26? I remember you have a table there. Yes, exactly this one. Yeah, uh, I think all the, I don't know whether it's simulation or performance evaluation on the rear forms. All the first three columns look uh, exactly like the the growth, but the, the last column, I, I don't understand what does that mean. And then you can see the, the value jumps a little bit different from the pattern of those three columns. So what, what's, what's the reason for that? Or well, the bandwidth? Yeah. The bandwidth because of pipelining. So we save some, we, we pipeline some messages. So it's not four messages, it's three. That's why. Okay. So the normal one way Protocol will take you two messages, right? So if you run it twice, it's four between wow. pipeline two. Any other questions? Have you tried it yourself? No. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. Oh. Yes. Okay, so let's take the uh, rest of the questions during the lunch, so we'll come back at 1 o'clock. So